Welcome to Asia's World City, a society with great diversity. Differences are respected and valued. A variety of cultures thrive harmoniously together. Hong Kong, the home that all belong. That was my fake British accent and my imitation of a typical infomercial about the inclusiveness and multiculturalism of Hong Kong. Does this kind of narrative sound familiar to you? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I see many of you nodding. It's true, uh, for many of us who are not from Hong Kong, that's our first impression, our assumption, expectation, and for some of us, even the motivation for coming to Hong Kong. And then we come here, we settle down, we fuse in for a year or two, we'll go around and we meet people. And then we start to realize that the reality is quite different from that common perception. Let me give you a few examples to explain what I mean by that. Now, I hear from some of my South Asian friends that they feel it's harder for them to rent an apartment in Hong Kong than the local Chinese people. I wanted to find out if that's true, so I did a little social experiment. Here's what I did. I used two WhatsApp numbers, one with this profile picture, uh, two Pakistani friends of mine, and my real name, Isa Ma. <laughs> the other, a random shot of myself in the office and a fake but very Hong Kong name, Jason Long. <laughs> so I used these two numbers to contact the same property agent and I wanted to see if the response is going to be any different. So here we go. Let's call the first agent Candy, all right? Isa asked Candy, hello ma'am, I saw this apartment in Aberdeen, I'm interested. Uh, is it available with the link attached? So Candy replied, sorry, rent out. All right, on the same day, October the 3rd, two and a half hours later, Jason Leung asked in Chinese, same link, hello, uh, I'm interested in this one, can I see it? Guess what Candy said? Yes, it can be arranged. Actually, there are several units available in this building. Do you want to see them all at once? When do you want to see it? Ouch. <laughs> so either the person who rented this place moved out within two and a half hours, or <laughs> something about the profile picture, or perhaps the name made Candy reluctant to rent to Isa Ma. Trial number two. Let's call this person Sam. So Isa asks Sam, uh, hello, Mr. Sam, Link, saw this apartment, interested, is it available? And he says, Hi, it's been leased, sorry. So on the same day, Jason Leung asked in Chinese, and he replies in Chinese, hi, it's been leased, sorry. So that was a relief, you know, I was thinking, huh, glad to know not everybody's like candy. But just when I was thinking that, uh, Sam replied to Jason Leung, there's another one, 8.8K, are you interested? Immediately, Isa Ma went and asked, is there any nearby with similar price? And he says, no, sorry. <laughs> Come on, Sam, I was proud of you a moment ago. Now you're just disappointing. Little did Sam and Candy know that the people they treated differently, probably because how they looked, uh, went to the same university, this one, uh, studied in the same, fa same faculty, and are good friends that appear in the same picture. <laughs> I also hear from my South Asian friends that they tend to get unwelcoming facial expressions and body reactions on the MTR. And I wanted to find out if that's true. So I did another social experiment. I asked another Pakistani friend of mine to wear the traditional Pakistani dress and just go and sit on the MTR. And I would be on the opposite side secretly taking a video. Let's see what happens. Wait. So you laughed. I believe you see what I see. Yes, these are individual cases, but I wouldn't say they are exceptional cases. These incidents are indicators of the difficulties, challenges, negative experiences that ethnic minorities in Hong Kong are going through to a much wider extent, but they are not paid enough attention to. According to South China Morning Post, uh, a property agent in Tuo Wan estimated about 60% of landlords he had come across refused to rent to ethnic minorities no matter how much they are willing to pay which echoes the result from another survey done in 2005 by the Department of, Department of Social Work at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which revealed that about 67% uh, of South Asian immigrants believe that they are discriminated against uh, by the local Chinese in various aspects. In a more comprehensive study uh, done by Hong Kong Unison, uh, an NGO dedicated to the rights of ethnic minorities, they collected close to 2,000 questionnaires from police recruits, secondary school students, teachers, university students, asking them questions related to racial acceptance. And the results show that Pakistanis, Africans, Nepalese, Indians, Filipinos are clearly and quite significantly less accepted than their Chinese, European, American, and Japanese counterparts. And this trend can be seen in the context of neighborhood, workplace, education, personal life, 
for the children and in general. Now with this data, we can't help thinking that perhaps Hong Kong is not as multicultural and inclusive as the branding tells us. Within the social environment, there are racially discriminative attitudes, uh, stereotypes, negative perceptions, and they are manifested by expressions, actions, reactions. But how did they come about? And more importantly, what made them so prevalent? What made Candy and Sam and the Chinese lady on MTR behave the way they did rather naturally? What is setting the reality apart from that Asia's world city vision and image? The mechanism behind the phenomenon is somewhat complex. It's a multi-dimensional process. And for that reason, I attempt to summarize it by what I call a 3D process. Three, three uh, words starting with D that uh, I believe are the key contributors to the problem. And they are denial, desensitization, and deprivation. Now, what do I mean by denial? See, there are four anti-discrimination ordinances in Hong Kong as of now, and they address cases of discrimination on the basis of sex, disability, family status, and race. The first ordinances were enacted in year 1996, 1996, 1997, respectively. Guess in which year did the racial discrimination ordinance, or the RDO, come into effect? 2009. What's interesting is that the RDO was proposed to the Legislative Council as early as 1990, which means it took 19 years for the RDO to be adopted and promulgated. And the reason for that, for the most part, is that in the early years, the government basically concluded that there's no such problem as race discrimination in Hong Kong, at least not ser serious enough to be addressed by law. So on the policy level, the problem of uh, racial discrimination and disharmony is largely denied. On the individual level, several research has shown that the majority of local Chinese people don't think there is serious racial and ethnic uh, discrimination in Hong Kong. So when racism in its various forms is denied, considered unproblematic, when it is not addressed, not challenged, not even mentioned much in the public discourse, then it becomes normalized, regularized, and stabilized. Both the perpetrators and victims of racial discrimination become less sensitive to it. Uh, a, a fellow hku -er wrote in her master's dissertation that uh, many people in Hong Kong have adopted a taken-for-granted approach to racial discrimination, where ethnic minorities are thinking, well, it keeps happening, and there seems nothing we can do to change it. Might as well just ignore, just accept it, just leave with it. And then the perpetrators of racism are thinking, well, they don't seem to mind. It doesn't seem to bother them. They're not complaining. They're not reacting. I guess it's OK. I guess it's not that bad. So there's a mutually reinforcing numbness on both sides which makes the RDO, the Equal Opportunities Commission, and other agencies and institutions that are meant for combating racism essentially ineffective. Because how can you combat the problem when you, don't, when you don't even see the problem? The first step towards solving any problem is acknowledging there is one. And that first step has not been very well accomplished in Hong Kong. Now, when denial and desensitization uh, are spread, ethnic minorities are deprived of an equal standing. They're deprived of many rights they're entitled to. They're deprived, oftentimes, of the, even the opportunity to challenge the injustice and to improve their situation. And deprivation can happen in many different aspects of the society. In terms of uh, accommodation, we've already seen the example. Uh, since many landlords and property agents refrain from renting to ethnic minorities, they are forced to go to a selected few areas in Hong Kong where they can actually find apartments easily. And that causes them to be geographically isolated. In terms of education, most schools in Hong Kong consciously or not adopted an assimilative approach to ethnic minority students, trying to acculturate them into the mainstream cultures and values while not genuinely uh, recognizing their cultural identity as equally valuable and legitimate. So in a research report uh, submitted by the, uh, several researchers from the Education University of Hong Kong to the government, they commented, and I quote, there's ample evidence to suggest that playgrounds in Hong Kong are sites for bullying and racial slurs. Now, when there is such a uh, cultural hierarchy, hidden hierarchy, uh, ethnic minority students, uh, their, their confidence and their self-esteem are affected. So learning to many of them become a stressful and not enjoyable experience, eventually leading to low achievements and high dropout rates. And then as a result, they, they can't find good jobs. Uh, career options available to them become scarce. Upward social mobility becomes unlikely. And all of this, collectively, marginalizes ethnic minorities in the society and deprives them of the ability to represent themselves in public spheres and exacerbates existing stereotypes and prejudices. Thus, a vicious cycle is created where negative perceptions 
uh, about ethnic minorities lead to limited opportunities for ethnic minorities, which results in a relatively low socioeconomic status, and then that renders a lack of resource for the next generation to utilize, and then the next generation repeats the same socioeconomic status, and then observable characteristics related to the repeatedly low socioeconomic status further reinforce the negative perception. So there are people who think, well, yes, we do have negative perceptions about certain ethnic groups in the society, but that's because they factually possess the negative characteristics. So they are thinking of the traits as a re reason for the perception. But I hope through this illustration of my, I'm making you see uh, the other side of the picture, which is equally true, if not more so. And that is, the traits are also a result of the negative perceptions. In other words, you may think that we think about ethnic minorities a certain way because they are that way. But it could very well be that they are the way they are because we think about them that way. Now, uh, this vicious cycle prevents change and progress. And that's why both international bodies, such as the UN Committee on uh, Elimination of Racial Discrimination, as well as uh, local scholars, such as Dr. Liz Jackson, a professor of education at Hong Kong U, noticed that lack of advancement. They noticed a stagnation. You know, uh, policies are not well implemented. Good intentions are not well translated into practical changes in society. So we need to break this stagnation. We need to start a motion, a movement, a transformation, a change in the way we conceptualize racial harmony and social inclusivity. And to be more specific, a motion that takes Hong Kong beyond multicultural and makes it intercultural. Now, what's the difference? I don't want to get too technical about the terms, but in general, multiculturalism is about the coexistence of different cultures, while interculturalism, on top of that, emphasizes meaningful interactions between cultures and interpersonal relationships. So it's more of a bottom-up approach. It's more about cross-cultural dialogues uh, and communication, mutual understandings on the individual level. You know, there are people who try to promote racial and cultural diversity by attempting to answer the question, why minorities matter? But from an intercultural perspective, that question itself is problematic uh, because that, uh, despite the good intentions, that kind of question strengthens a binary, differentiating, even raveling way of looking at different cultures. And there is an unequal hierarchical assumption behind because we don't ask the question why majorities matter, right? So a motion towards interculturalism is a motion that tries to bypass that assumption. It's a motion towards independent, unbiased, and experiential inf investigation of different cultures on the individual level. And that's why you need to be a part of this motion. And by you, I mean you in the second row who's sleeping. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> by you, I mean every one of you. Uh, because if you think about it, every one of us is a minority in some way. If it's not because of your race or ethnicity, it could be because of your dietary preferences, your research interests, uh, your taste of books, the sports that you play. There are many things that can make you a minority group. And since you don't want to be treated differently because of the things that made you a minority, let's not endorse it when it's done to others. Enough motivation, I hope. Now, how do we practically uh, contribute to this motion? What can you do? There's plenty of things you can do. Uh, this is Sahara, a current HKU student majoring in biochemistry. She's a local Pakistani lady. And she said Hong Kong has a culture of not questioning because it's considered offensive. Is that true? Oh, sorry, no offense, no offense, but is that true? I guess it is. Uh, her advice is be proactive, go and ask. Get your, get your questions answered uh, through open communication because holding on to misconceptions is much worse than the possible embarrassment from honest questions. And she even encouraged, encouraged you by saying, we ethnic minorities welcome all sorts of questions from everyone, but you know, not literally all sorts of questions. I wouldn't suggest you ask her if she's single, unless you're very serious. So that's the first thing you can do, ask questions, communicate, talk with people. The second thing you can do, Pay a visit. You've already seen this person, Isama, half of Isama. No, one of the persons uh, in that profile picture. Uh, and I invited him once to my residence, and it was such a nice uh, gathering. And we had a beautiful experience learning about each other's culture. I've also visited my non-Chinese friends uh, in Hong Kong, their, their homes. And every time I learn a little more and ex experience more about different cultures. So uh, I want to ask the local Chinese audience here, how many of you have non-Chinese friends? Your, uh, can I just say a show of hands? Many of you. All right. Among these people, how many of you have visited other local Chinese friends' homes? R really? Okay. And how many of you have visited your non-Chinese friends' homes? 
okay, less than previously. So that's my point. Why not? Why don't visit your non-Chinese friends' homes? Uh, visiting is one of the most efficient way of experiencing and learning about a culture. Now, once you gain more knowledge and understanding through uh, communicating verbally and visiting physically, now you're ready for the third step, which is to raise awareness, to speak out against discrimination, uh, you know, to help other people correct their misconceptions. And by doing this, you're definitely making Hong Kong great again, but different from President Trump. <laughs> You are making Hong Kong great again, but different from President Trump, you are taking down barriers and walls instead of building them. Uh, so ask, uh, visit, and spread. All of us can do it, and I hope all of us will do it. Remember in the beginning I said perception is not equal to reality? You know what? It can be. Asia's World City can be brought into reality by intercultural individuals who care and work towards it. It, this is a collective project. Every social member shares a part of the responsibility, and every person's contribution matters. You need to join this motion. And together, when we start this motion, when we become a part of this motion, and when we add this motion to the perception, we have ourselves a beautiful reality. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to end my talk by reciting a verse from the Quran, uh, the Islamic scripture, which Muslims believe to be the verbatim words of God. I think it's a verse that beautifully captures the essence of human communism and diversity. So you can read the English translation while I recite the Arabic words. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqanakum min zakarin wa unsa wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum inda allahi atqaakum inna allaha alimun khabir Thank you.